14 June, 1942. On Friday, June 12th, I woke up at 6 o'clock, and no wonder it was my birthday. But of course, I was not allowed to get up at that hour, so I had to control my curiosity until a quarter to seven. Then I could bear it no longer and went to the dining room where I received a warm welcome from Moche, the cat. Soon after seven, I went to Mummy and Daddy and then to the sitting room to undo my presents. The first to greet me was you, possibly the nicest of all. Then on the table, there were a bunch of roses, a plant and some peonies, and more arrived during the day. I got masses of things from Mummy and Daddy and was thoroughly spoiled by various friends. Among other things, I was given Camera Obscura, a party game, lots of sweets, chocolates, a puzzle, a brooch, Tales and Legends of the Netherlands by Joseph Cohen, Daisy's Mountain Holiday, a terrific book, and some money. Now I can buy The Myths of Greece and Rome. Grand. Then Lise called for me and we went to school. During recess, I treated everyone to sweet biscuits, and then we had to get back to our lessons. Now I must stop. Bye-bye. We're going to be great pals. Saturday, 20 June, 1942. I haven't written for a few days because I wanted, first of all, to think about my diary. It's an odd idea for someone like me to keep a diary, not only because I've never done so before, but because it seems to me that neither I, nor for that matter anyone else, will be interested in the unbosomings of a 13-year-old schoolgirl. Still, what does that matter? I want to write, but more than that, I want to bring out all kinds of things that lie buried deep in my heart. There is a saying that paper is more patient than man. It came back to me on one of my slightly melancholy days while I sat chin in hand, feeling too bored and limp even to make up my mind whether to go out or stay at home. Yes, there is no doubt that paper is patient, and as I don't intend to show this cardboard-covered notebook bearing the proud name of diary to anyone, unless I find a real friend, boy or girl, probably nobody cares. And now I come to the root of the matter, the reason for my starting a diary. It is that I have no such real friend. Let me put it more clearly, since no one will believe that a girl of 13 feels herself quite alone in the world, nor is it so. I have darling parents and a sister of 16. I know about 30 people whom one might call friends. I have strings of boyfriends anxious to catch a glimpse of me and who, failing that, peep at me through mirrors in class. I have relations, aunts and uncles, who are darlings too. A good home. No, I don't seem to lack anything. But it's the same with all my friends. Just fun and joking, nothing more. I can never bring myself to talk about anything outside the common round. We don't seem to be able to get any closer. That's the root of the trouble. Perhaps I lack confidence. But anyway, there it is, a stubborn fact, and I don't seem to be able to do anything about it. Hence this diary. In order to enhance in my mind's eye the picture of the friend for whom I've waited so long, I don't want to set down a series of bald facts in a diary like most people do, but I want this diary itself to be my friend, and I shall call my friend Kitty. No one will grasp what I'm talking about if I begin my letters to Kitty just out of the blue, so, albeit unwillingly, I will start by sketching in brief the story of my life. My father was 36 when he married my mother, who was then 25. My sister Margaret was born in 1926 in Frankfurt on Main. I followed on June 12, 1929, and as we are Jewish... We emigrated to Holland in 1933, where my father was appointed managing director of Travis Incorporated. This firm is in close relationship with the firm of Colin and Company in the same building of which my father is a partner. The rest of our family, however, felt the full impact of Hitler's anti-Jewish laws, so life was filled with anxiety. 
In 1938, after the pogroms, my two uncles, my mother's brothers, escaped to the United States. My old grandmother came to us. She was then 73. After May 1940, good times rapidly fled. First the war, then the capitulation, followed by the arrival of the Germans, which is when the sufferings of us Jews really began. Anti-Jewish decrees followed each other in quick succession. Jews must wear a yellow star. Jews must hand in their bicycles. Jews are banned from trams and are forbidden to drive. Jews are only allowed to do their shopping between 3 and 5 o'clock, and then only in shops which bear the placard, Jewish shop. Jews must be indoors at 8 o'clock and cannot even sit in their own gardens after that hour. Jews are forbidden to visit theatres, cinemas, and other places of entertainment. Jews may not take part in public sports. Swimming baths, tennis courts, hockey fields, and other sports grounds are all prohibited to them. Jews may not visit Christians. Jews must go to Jewish schools and many other restrictions of a similar kind. So we could not do this and were forbidden to do that. But life went on in spite of it all. Yopi used to say to me, you're scared to do anything because it may be forbidden. Our freedom was strictly limited, yet things were still bearable. Granny died in 1942. No one will ever know how much she is present in my thoughts and how much I love her still. In 1934, I went to school at the Montessori kindergarten and continued there. It was at the end of the school year, I was in Form B, when I had to say goodbye to Mrs. K. We both wept. It was very sad. In 1941, I went with my sister Margaret to the Jewish secondary school, she into the fourth form and I into the first. So far, everything is all right with the four of us, and here I come to the present day. Sunday morning. 5 July, 1942. Dear Kitty, our examination results were announced in the Jewish theater last Friday. I couldn't have hoped for better. My report is not at all bad. I had one vixatis, a five for algebra, two sixes, and the rest were all sevens or eights. They were certainly pleased at home. Although over the question of marks, my parents are quite different from most. They don't care a bit whether my reports are good or bad, as long as I'm well and happy and not too cheeky. Then the rest will come by itself. I am just the opposite. I don't want to be a bad pupil. I should really have stayed in the seventh form in the Montessori school, but was accepted for the Jewish secondary. When all the Jewish children had to go to Jewish schools, the headmaster took Lise and me conditionally after a bit of persuasion. He relied on us to do our best, and I don't want to let him down. My sister Margaret has her report, too. Brilliant, as usual. She would move up with cum laude if that existed at school. She's so brainy. Daddy has been at home a lot lately, as there's nothing for him to do at business. It must be rotten to feel so superfluous. Mr. Copehouse has taken over Travis, and Mr. Crawler, the firm Coland and Company. When we walked across our little square together a few days ago, Daddy began to talk of us going into hiding. I asked him why on earth he was beginning to talk of that already. Yes, Anne, he said. You know that we've been taking food, clothes, furniture to other people for more than a year now. We don't want our belongings to be seized by the Germans, but we certainly don't want to fall into their clutches ourselves. So we shall disappear of our own accord and not wait until they come and fetch us. But, Daddy, when would it be? He spoke so seriously that I grew very anxious. Don't you worry about it. We shall arrange everything. Make the most of your carefree young life while you can. That was all. Oh, may the fulfillment of these somber words remain far distant yet. Yours, Anne. Thursday, 9 July, 1942. Dear Kitty, So we walked in the pouring rain, Daddy, Mummy, and I, each with a school satchel and shopping bag, filled to the brim with all kinds of things thrown together anyhow. We got sympathetic looks from people on their way to work. 
You could see by their faces how sorry they were they couldn't offer us a lift. The gaudy yellow star spoke for itself. Only when we were on the road did Mummy and Daddy begin to tell me bits and pieces about the plan. For months, as many of our goods and chattels and necessities of life as possible had been sent away, and they were sufficiently ready for us to have gone into hiding of our own accord on July 16th. The plan had had to be speeded up ten days because of the call-up, so our quarters would not be so well organized, but we had to make the best of it. The hiding place itself would be in the building where Daddy has his office. It will be hard for outsiders to understand, but I shall explain that later on. Daddy didn't have many people working for him. Mr. Crowler, Cope House, Meep, and Ellie Varson, a 23-year-old typist, who all knew of our arrival. Mr. Fawson, Ellie's father, and two boys worked in the warehouse. They had not been told. I will describe the building. There is a large warehouse on the ground floor which is used as a store. The front door to the house is next to the warehouse door, and inside the front door is a second doorway which leads to a staircase. There is another door at the top of the stairs with a frosted glass window in it which has office written in black letters across it. That is the large main office, very big, very light, and very full. Ellie Meep and Mr. Copehouse work there in the daytime. A small dark room containing the safe, a wardrobe, and a large cupboard leads to a small, somewhat dark second office. Mr. Crawler and Mr. Fontan used to sit here. Now it is only Mr. Crawler. One can reach Crawler's office from the passage, but only via a glass door which can be opened from the inside, but not easily from the outside. From Crawler's office, a long passage goes past the coal store, up four steps, and leads to the showroom of the whole building, the private office. Dark, dignified furniture, linoleum and carpets on the floor, radio, smart lamp, everything first class. Next door, there's a roomy kitchen with a hot water faucet and a gas stove. Next door, the WC. That is the first floor. A wooden staircase leads from the downstairs passage to the next floor. There's a small landing at the top. There is a door at each end of the landing, the left one leading to a storeroom at the front of the house and to the attics. One of those really steep Dutch staircases runs from the side to the other door opening onto the street. The right-hand door leads to our secret annex. No one would ever guess that there would be so many rooms hidden behind that plain gray door. There's a little step in front of the door, and then you're inside. There is a steep staircase immediately opposite the entrance. On the left, a tiny passage brings you into a room which was to have become the Franck family's bed sitting room. Next door, a smaller room, study and bedroom for the two young ladies of the family. On the right, a little room without windows containing a wash basin and a small WC compartment with another door leading to Margaret's and my room. If you go up the next flight of stairs and open the door, you are simply amazed that there could be such a big light room in such an old house by the canal. There's a gas stove in this room, thanks to the fact that it was used as a laboratory and a sink. This is now the kitchen, the fondant couple, besides being general living room, dining room, and scullery. A tiny little corridor room will become Peter Fondant's apartment. Then, just as on the lower landing, there's a large attic. So there you are. I've introduced you to the whole of our beautiful secret annex. Yours, Anne. Tuesday, 10 November, 1942. Dear Kitty... Great news. We want to take in an eighth person. Yes, really. We've always thought that there was quite enough room and food for one more. We were only afraid of giving Copehouse and Crowler more trouble. But now that the appalling stories we hear about Jews are getting even worse, Daddy got hold of the two people who had to decide, and they thought it was an excellent plan. It is just as dangerous for seven as for eight, they said, and quite rightly. When this was settled, we ran through our circle of friends, trying to think of a single person who would fit in well with our family. It wasn't difficult to hit on someone. 
After Daddy had refused all members of the Fondan family, we chose a dentist called Albert Dussel, whose wife was fortunate enough to be out of the country when the war broke out. He is known to be quiet, and so far as we and Mr. Fondan can judge from a superficial acquaintance, both families think he's a congenial person. Meep knows him too, so she will be able to make arrangements for him to join us. If he comes, he will have to sleep in my room instead of Margaret, who will use the camp bed. Yours, Anne. Friday, 20 November, 1942. Dear Kitty, None of us really knows how to take it all. The news about the Jews had not really penetrated through to us until now, and we thought it best to remain as cheerful as possible. Every now and then, when Meep lets out something about what has happened to a friend, Mummy and Mrs. Fontana always begin to cry, so Meep thinks it better not to tell us any more. But Dussel was immediately plied with questions from all sides, and the stories he told us were so gruesome and dreadful that one can't get them out of one's mind. Yet we shall still have our jokes and tease each other when these horrors have faded a bit in our minds. It won't do us any good or help those outside to go on being as gloomy as we are at the moment. And what would be the object of making our secret annex into a secret annex of gloom? Must I keep thinking about those other people, whatever I'm doing? And if I want to laugh about something, should I stop myself quickly and feel ashamed that I'm cheerful? Ought I then to cry the whole day long? No, that I can't do. Besides, in time, this gloom will wear off. Added to this misery, there's another, but of a purely personal kind, and it pales into insignificance beside all the wretchedness I've just told you about. Still, I can't refrain from telling you that lately I've begun to feel deserted. I'm surrounded by too great a void. I never used to feel like this. My fun and amusements and my girlfriends completely filled my thoughts. Now I either think about unhappy things or about myself. And at long last I've made the discovery that Daddy although he's such a darling, still cannot take the place of my entire little world of bygone days. But why do I bother you with such foolish things? I'm very ungrateful, Kitty, I know that, but it often makes my head swim if I'm jumped upon too much, and then on top of that, to have to think about all those other miseries. Yours, Anne. Friday, 2 April, 1943. Dear Kitty, oh dear, I've got another terrible black mark against my name. I was lying in bed yesterday evening, waiting for Daddy to come and say my prayers with me and wish me good night, when Mummy came into my room, sat on my bed and asked very nicely, Anne, Daddy can't come yet, shall I say your prayers with you tonight? No, Mummy, I answered. Mummy got up, paused by my bed for a moment, and walked slowly towards the door. Suddenly she turned around and, with a distorted look on her face, said, I don't want to be cross. Love cannot be forced. There were tears in her eyes as she left the room. I lay still in bed, feeling at once that I'd been horrible to push her away so rudely, but I knew, too, that I couldn't have answered differently. It simply wouldn't work. I felt sorry for Mummy, very, very sorry, because I had seen for the first time in my life that she minds my coldness. I saw the look of sorrow on her face when she spoke of love not being forced. It is hard to speak the truth, and yet it is the truth. She herself has pushed me away. Her tactless remarks and her crude jokes, which I don't find at all funny, have now made me insensitive to any love from her side. Just as I shrink at her hard words, so did her heart when she realized that the love between us was gone. She cried half the night and hardly slept at all. Daddy doesn't look at me, and if he does for a second, then I read in his eyes the words, How can you be so unkind? How can you bring yourself to cause your mother such sorrow? Oh, they expect me to apologize. 
But this is something I can't apologize for because I spoke the truth. And Mummy will have to know it sooner or later anyway. I seem, and indeed am, indifferent both to Mummy's tears and Daddy's looks because for the first time they are both aware of something which I've always felt. I can only feel sorry for Mummy, who has now had to discover that I have adopted her own attitude. For myself, I remain silent and aloof. And I shall not shrink from the truth any longer, because the longer it is put off, the more difficult it will be for them when they do hear it. Yours, Anne. Friday, 23 July, 1943. Dear Kitty, just for fun, I'm going to tell you each person's first wish when we're allowed to go outside again. Margaret and Mr. Fondan long more than anything for a hot bath Bills are overflowing and want to stay in it for half an hour. Mrs. Fontan wants to go and eat cream cakes immediately. Dussel thinks of nothing but seeing Lotte, his wife. Mummy of her cup of coffee. Daddy's going to visit Mr. Fossin first. Peter the town and a cinema. While I should find it so blissful, I shouldn't know where to start. But most of all, I long for a home of our own. To be able to move freely and to have some help with my work again at last. In other words, school. Ellie has offered to get some fruit. It costs next to nothing. Grapes, 75 cents a pound. Gooseberries, 20 cents per pound. One peach, 14 cents. One two-pound melon, 42 cents. Then you see in the newspapers every evening in bold letters, play fair and keep prices down. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, 4 August, 1943. Dear Kitty, now that we've been in the secret annex for over a year, you know something of our lives, but some of it is quite indescribable. There's so much to tell. Everything is so different from ordinary times and from ordinary people's lives. But still, to give you a closer look into our lives, now and again, I intend to give you a description of an ordinary day. Today, I'm beginning with the evening and night. Nine o'clock in the evening. The bustle of going to bed in the secret annex begins, and it is always really quite a business. Chairs are shoved about, beds are pulled down, blankets unfolded, nothing remains where it is during the day. I sleep on a little divan, which is not more than one and a half meters long, so chairs have to be used to lengthen it. A quilt, sheets, pillows, blankets are all fetched from Dussel's bed, where they remain during the day. One hears terrible creaking in the next room, Margaret's concertina bed being pulled out. Again, divan, blankets, and pillows. Everything is done to make the wooden slats a bit more comfortable. It sounds like thunder above, but it is only Mrs. Fondan's bed. This is shifted to the window, you see, in order to give Her Majesty in the pink bed jacket fresh air to tickle her dainty nostrils. After paint is finished, I step into the washing cubicle where I give myself a thorough wash and general toilet. It occasionally happens, only in the hot weeks or months, that there is a tiny flea floating in the water. Then teeth cleaning, hair curling, manicure, and my cotton wool pads with hydrogen peroxide to bleach black mustache hairs, all this in under half an hour. Half past nine... Quickly into dressing gowns, soap in one hand, potty, hairpins, pants, curlers, and cotton wool in the other, I hurry out of the bathroom. But usually, I'm called back once for the various hairs which decorate the wash basin in graceful curves, but which are not approved of by the next person. Ten o'clock. Put up the blackout. Good night. For at least a quarter of an hour, there's a creaking of beds and a sighing of broken springs. Then all is quiet. At least, that is, if our neighbors upstairs don't quarrel in bed. Half past eleven. The bathroom door creaks. A narrow strip of light falls into the room. A squeak of shoes. A large coat. 
even larger than the man inside it. Dussel returns from his night work in Crawler's office, shuffling on the floor for ten minutes, crackle of paper, that's the food which has to be stowed away, and a bed is made. Then the form disappears again, and one only hears suspicious noises from the lavatory from time to time. Three o'clock. I have to get up for a little job in the metal pot under my bed, which is on a rubber mat for safety's sake in case of leakage. When this has to take place, I always hold my breath as it clatters into the tin like a brook from a mountain. Then the pot is returned to its place, and the figure in the white nightgown, which evokes the same cry from Margaret every evening, Oh, that indecent nightdress! steps back into bed. Then a certain person lies awake for about a quarter of an hour, listening to the sounds of the night. Firstly, to whether there might not be a burglar downstairs, then to the various beds above, next door, and in my room, from which one is usually able to make out how the various members of the household are sleeping, or how they pass the night in wakefulness. The latter is certainly not pleasant especially when it concerns a member of the family by the name of Dossel. First I hear a sound like a fish gasping for breath. This is repeated nine or ten times, and then, with much ado and interchanged with little smacking sounds, the lips are moistened, followed by a lengthy twisting and turning in bed and rearranging of pillows. Five minutes perfect peace. And then the same sequence of events unfolds itself at least three times more after the doctor has soothed himself to sleep again for a little while. It can also happen that we get a bit of shooting in the night, varying between one o'clock and four. I never really realize it until from habit I'm already standing at my bedside. Sometimes I'm so busy dreaming that I'm thinking about French irregular verbs or a quarrel upstairs. It is some time before I begin to realize that guns are firing and that I am still in the room, but it usually happens as described above. I quickly grab a pillow and handkerchief, put on my dressing gown and slippers and scamper to Daddy, like Margaret wrote in this birthday poem. The first shot sounds at dead of night. Hush, look, a door creaks open wide. A little girl glides into sight, clasping a pillow to her side. Once landed in the big bed, the worst is over, except if the firing gets very bad. Quarter to seven. Bring the alarm clock that raises its voice at any hour of the day, if one asks for it, and sometimes when one doesn't. Crack. Ping. Mrs. Fondon has turned it off. Creak. Mr. Fondon gets up, puts on water, and then full speed to the bathroom. Quarter past seven. The door creaks again. Dussel can go to the bathroom. Once alone, I take down the blackout, and a new day in the secret annex has begun. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, 5 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, I have two things to confess to you today which will take a long time. But I must tell someone, and you're the best one to tell, as I know that, come what may, you always keep a secret. The first is about mummy. You know that I've grumbled a lot about mummy, yet still tried to be nice to her again. Now it is suddenly clear to me what she lacks. Mummy herself has told us that she looked upon us more as her friends than as her daughters. Now that is all very fine, but still, a friend can't take a mother's place. I need my mother as an example which I can follow. I want to be able to respect her. I have the feeling that Margaret thinks differently about these things and would never be able to understand what I've just told you. And Daddy avoids all arguments about Mummy. I imagine a mother is a woman who, 
in the first place, shows great tact, especially towards her children when they reach our age, and who does not laugh at me if I cry about something, not pain, but other things like Mum's does. One thing, which perhaps may seem rather fatuous, I have never forgiven her. It was on a day that I had to go to the dentist. Mummy and Margaret were going to come with me and agreed that I should take my bicycle. When we'd finished at the dentist and were outside again, Margaret and Mummy told me that they were going into the town to look at something or buy something. I don't remember exactly what. I wanted to go too, but was not allowed to as I had my bicycle with me. Tears of rage sprang into my eyes and Mummy and Margaret began laughing at me. Then I became so furious that I stuck my tongue out at them in the street just as an old woman happened to pass by who looked very shocked. I rode home on my bicycle, and I know I cried for a long time. It is queer that the wound that Mummy made then still burns when I think of how angry I was that afternoon. The second is something that is very difficult to tell you because it is about myself. Yesterday, I read an article about blushing by Sis Hester. This article might have been addressed to me personally, although I don't blush very easily. The other things in it certainly all fit me. She writes roughly something like this, that a girl in the years of puberty becomes quiet within and begins to think about the wonders that are happening to her body. I experience that, too. And that is why I get the feeling lately of being embarrassed about Margaret and Mummy and Daddy. Strangely enough, Margaret, who's much more shy than I am, isn't at all embarrassed. I think what is happening to me is so wonderful. And not only what can be seen on my body, but all that's taking place inside. I never discuss myself or any of these things with anybody. That is why I have to talk to myself about them. Each time I have a period and that has only been three times, I have the feeling that, in spite of all the pain, unpleasantness, and nastiness, I have a sweet secret. And that is why, although it's nothing but a nuisance to me in a way, I always long for the time that I shall feel that secret within me again. Sis Hester also writes that girls of this age don't feel quite certain of themselves and discover that they themselves are individuals with ideas, thoughts, and habits. After I came here, when I was just 14, I began to think about myself sooner than most girls and to know that I am a person. Sometimes, when I lie in bed at night, I have a terrible desire to feel my breasts and to listen to the quiet, rhythmic beat of my heart. I already had these kinds of feelings subconsciously before I came here because I remember that once when I slept with a girlfriend I had a strong desire to kiss her and that I did do so. I could not help being terribly inquisitive over her body for she'd always kept it hidden from me. I asked her whether, as a proof of our friendship, we should feel one another's breasts, but she refused. I go into ecstasies every time I see the naked figure of a woman, such as Venus, for example. It strikes me as so wonderful and exquisite that I have difficulty in stopping the tears rolling down my cheeks. If only I had a girlfriend. Yours, Anne. Saturday, 12 February, 1944. Dear Kitty, the sun is shining the sky is a deep blue. There's a lovely breeze. And I'm longing, so longing for everything. To talk, for freedom, for friends, to be alone. And I do so long to cry. I feel as if I'm going to burst. And I know it would get better with crying, but I can't. I'm restless. I go from one room to the other. Breathe through the crack of a closed window. Feel my heart beating as if it's saying, Can't you satisfy my longings at last? I believe that it's spring within me. I feel that spring is awakening. I feel it in my whole body and soul. It is an effort to behave normally. I feel utterly confused. Don't know what to read, what to write, what to do. I only know that I'm longing. Yours, Anne. Sunday, 13 February, 1944. Dear Kitty, since Saturday a lot has changed for me. 
it came about like this. I longed, and am still longing, but now something has happened which has made it a little, just a little less. To my great joy, I will be quite honest about it, already this morning I noticed that Peter kept looking at me all the time. Not in the ordinary way. I don't know how. I just can't explain. I used to think that Peter was in love with Margaret, but yesterday I suddenly had the feeling that it is not so. I made a special effort not to look at him too much, because whenever I did, he kept on looking too, and then, yes, then, it, it gave me a lovely feeling inside, but which I mustn't feel too often. I desperately want to be alone. Daddy has noticed that I'm not quite my usual self, but I really can't tell him everything. Leave me in peace, leave me alone. That's what I'd like to keep crying at all the time. Who knows? A day may come when I'm left alone more than I would wish. Yours, Anne. Friday, 18 February, 1944. Dear Kitty, whenever I go upstairs now, I keep on hoping that I shall see him. Because my life now has an object and I have something to look forward to, everything has become more pleasant. At least the object of my feelings is always there, and I needn't be afraid of rivals except Margaret. Don't think I'm in love, because I'm not. But I do have the feeling all the time that something fine can grow up between us, something that gives confidence and friendship. If I get half a chance, I go up to him now. It's not like it used to be when he didn't know how to begin. It's just the opposite. He's still talking when I'm half out of the room. Mummy doesn't like it much and always says I'll be a nuisance and that I must leave him in peace. Honestly, doesn't she realize that I've got some intuition? She looks at me so queerly every time I go into Peter's little room. If I come downstairs from there, she asks me where I've been. I simply can't bear it and think it's horrible. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, 23 February, 1944. Dear Kitty, it's lovely weather outside, and I've quite perked up since yesterday. Nearly every morning I go to the attic where Peter works to blow the stuffy air out of my lungs. From my favorite spot on the floor, I look up at the blue sky and the bare chestnut tree on whose branches little raindrops shine, appearing like silver, and at the seagulls and other birds as they glide on the wind. He stood with his head against a thick beam, and I sat down. We breathed the fresh air, looked outside, and both felt that the spell should not be broken by words. We remained like this for a long time, and when he had to go up to the loft to chop wood, I knew that he was a nice fellow. He climbed the ladder and I followed. Then he chopped wood for about a quarter of an hour, during which time we still remained silent. I watched him from where I stood. <laughs> he was obviously doing his best to show off his strength. But I looked out of the open window, too, over a large area of Amsterdam, over all the roofs, and onto the horizon, which was such a pale blue that it was hard to see the dividing line. As long as this exists, I thought... And I may live to see it, this sunshine, the cloudless skies. While this lasts, I cannot be unhappy. The best remedy for those who are afraid, lonely, or unhappy is to go outside, somewhere where they can be quite alone with the heavens, nature, and God. Because only then does one feel that all is as it should be, and that God wishes to see people happy amidst the simple beauty of nature. As long as this exists, and it certainly always will, I know that then there will always be comfort for every sorrow, whatever the circumstances may be, and I firmly believe that nature brings solace in all troubles. Oh, who knows? Perhaps it won't be long before I can share this overwhelming feeling of bliss with someone who feels the way I do about it. Yours, Anne. Saturday, 4 March, 1944. Dear Kitty, this is the first Saturday for months and months that hasn't been boring, dreary, and dull, and Pater is the cause. 
This morning I went to the attic to hang up my apron when Daddy asked whether I'd like to stay and talk some French. I agreed. First we talked French and I explained something to Peter. Then we did some English. Daddy read out loud to us from Dickens and I was in the seventh heaven because I sat on Daddy's chair very close to Peter. I went downstairs at 11 o'clock. When I came upstairs again at half past 11, he was already waiting for me on the stairs. We talked until a quarter to one. If, as I leave the room, he gets a chance after a meal, for instance, and if no one can hear, he says, Goodbye, Anne. See you soon. Oh, I am so pleased. I wonder if he is going to fall in love with me after all. Anyway, he's a very nice fellow. And no one knows what lovely talks I have with him. Mrs. Fondon quite approves when I go and talk to him. But she asked today, teasing me, can I really trust you two up there together? Of course, I protested. Really, you quite insult me. From morn till night, I look forward to seeing Peter. Yours, Anne.